If you don't agree with me, the only possible explanation is that you're crazy. You're irrational. You couldn't possibly have a different data set or a different perspective. It couldn't possibly that be that, that I'm crazy, that I'm trying to force some beliefs on you. I'm trying to trick you into letting me exploit you. No, no, no. It, it's, you're just insane. It's, it's fine. We have, we have pills for this. There's treatment. We can do electroshocks. We can lock you up. We can commit you. Whatever it is. We, if, you, if you do not go along with our racket, of social control will take care of you. Now, the latest in coronavirus gaslighting comes today from Newsweek. Now, there's been a lot of gaslighting around corona. For those of you who don't know, gaslighting is a very, very destructive kind of psychological manipulation to try to convince some someone that they're crazy and then it's a, it's a reference to an old theatrical uh it's an old play where a uh, husband is trying to convince his wife that she's crazy and he de dims the gas lights and she goes oh it's getting darker no it's just you you're crazy you know and and this has now become the term that we use to describe crazy making making people feel that they're crazy if they don't agree with you or go along with your policy because you know a lot of times it's like if if you know, if if I want to uh, if I want to mug you, and I want to do it through deception, and, you know, I, I instead of putting a gun to your head and saying, "Hey, give me your wallet, or I'm going to shoot you," I can say, "Hey, you know, uh, you really should give me all, all your wallet because if if you don't, uh, you're going to get this virus that's going around. You haven't heard about it? It's the wallet virus. Hey, I'm hey, I'm just doing a public service thing here. I've got my little my little wallet sequestration bag. You just put your wallet in here." And you'll be safe from the wallet virus. Oh, you don't believe in the wallet virus? Well, you must be crazy. But don't worry. We'll take care of you. So the headline from Newsweek today, sociopaths are more likely to refuse wearing a mask and other COVID-19 measures study finds. Oh, well, if the study found it's true, it must be. Now, I'm not actually, I'm not, I'm not even going to challenge the veracity of this article or this study, I mean, it, 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 and it's like, ha, huh, woo, good job, government. You got us. This is, this is what, and, and this is like, yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a typical, you know, libertarian fake trap that they try to set for us. Like, oh, you don't want government welfare. Why do you hate the poor? Well, no, because I think peaceful welfare is going to take care of the poor better than violent welfare through government is that does that make me crazy no that means you're the sane one resisting this racket that everyone else is going along with a new study from brazil has found that people with sociopathic traits are more likely to not comply with mask wearing and other measures to limit the spread of coronavirus the study investigated the relationship between antisocial personality traits and compliance with COVID-19 measures using a sample of 1,578 Brazilian age, adults aged between 18 and 73. Now, here's the thing. Why, why do I say good? Good on you, government. You got you got us this time, the free thinkers. But you know, it is it's a trap that you try to set for us a lot because with COVID, uh, there are sort of two reasons, big two bigger lots of. I mean. <laughs> You don't want a diaper on your face. You don't want to increase your risk of staph infection. You don't want to increase your risk of getting the flu or corona because masks actually can increase the risk of viral infection when worn for prolonged periods and handled improperly. Yeah, just touching your face all the time, touching surfaces, rebreathing air and moist environment. Yeah, even that, like in, th there are studies that show in controlled environments where they, yeah, that's what you need for it to be, you know, science like that, uh, decisive experimental results. You have a control group, you have an experimental group, so that wearing masks, the way that they're suggesting, actually increased transmission of the flu. So maybe you don't want to wear it because uh, you have some, well, like there's there was the autistic kid, who, like couldn't wear because he was autistic. like he put something on his face, freaked out, totally dysfunctional. And you go, well, 
tough shit. That kid's not going to wear a mask. There's no way this virus says, well, you got, you know, we're going to accommodate that kid. He goes to Disneyland and they say, Haha, no, we're not going to accommodate that kid. We can't have one kid who's autistic, legitimately autistic, running around Disneyland without a mask. In fact, all the senior citizens hanging out there creeping on the kids. Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to wear a mask. There are two big categories are either you're a sociopath and you don't care about other people or you realize it's bullshit and you have other rational reasons. And it's sort of like what they have done. This is the, this is the, the, the devilish cleverness of the coronavirus hoax is that now free thinkers and sociopaths look the same in public. Most people don't care about being free thinkers, but they care about not being sociopaths, right? So what were the scores here? They, 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 the researchers found those who had higher scores and traits, including callousness, deceitfulness, hostility, impulsivity, irresponsibility, manipulative, manipulativeness, and risk-taking tended to be less compliant with COVID-19 containment measures, such as mask wearing, hand washing, and social distancing. But those who had higher levels of empathy tended to be more compliant with the measures. Now, see, if, if you could separate the reasons why people are doing this, you'd see that there are some of us who, who are not wearing masks because of a heightened expression of empathy. Now, I'm not going to sit here and be, oh, I'm the most, uh, uh, I'm the humblest man on earth. My mom told me so. No, I, I'm, I, 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 I know that my work, what I do, this podcast, my activism, spreading the message of libertarianism, which is nonviolence of peace and love and the ideal of a, a harmonious, nonviolent world. This is motivated by empathy. Feeling for my fellow human beings. And like I went to I went to Flagstaff yesterday. I had to run some errands. I went to Walmart. And in Walmart there are a few hundred people in there. And I saw four of us total not wearing masks. At one point I wanted to take a picture. I wanted to like get a selfie at the, you know past the checkout line, put my hat and glasses on, no mask, go take a picture with like sea of zombies behind me just to record the moment. But I, I, I hear that uh, statists don't like having their pictures taken in public. They don't understand how the First Amendment works. I didn't want to trigger anybody with that. So um, I don't know. That also wasn't the best photo op. You know, Walmart checkout line. There, there will be others, I'm sure. And I'm sure other people have taken better selfies like that. But then I, I, I went to the gym. And the gym was closed. Anytime fitness flagstaff closed by state orders here in Arizona. This happens to be in the same strip mall as a bank of military recruiting center. So I saw across the parking lot as I was uh, walking away from the gym and I took a picture of the sign like, oh man, I got to record this for posterity. I look across the parking lot and there's a Marine. Full digi greens. Actually, he was outside without a cover on. Don't worry, I won't report you. And he was on a cell phone. Walking on a cell phone. Now, that's technically, at least when I was in, you were supposed to do that. Um, so rec recruiters get to bend a lot of those rules. And I, 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 I rang the doorbell. They let me in. And I was just like, hey, guys, what's going on? And I, I didn't want I didn't get too political with it. I just a little bit around Corona and said, you know, what's what's this? up? Yeah, what's up with this? The gym across the way is closed. You guys aren't closed. You guys have been you guys deal with any restrictions at all due to the coronavirus or shutdowns or anything as, as recruiters. And like, no, no, three dudes in the office, no masks, no gloves, no distancing, walked up, shook my hand. No big deal. I said, what's it, well, what's it like? You guys still going to schools? And you know what? In Flagstaff, schools are closed. Fall semester starting. I'm sorry. They're, they're remote, I should say. Schools are, are operating remotely. Wow. I mean, and, and, and yeah, we're going to get into this today. There are some horror stories out there about what remote schooling looks like when you're not ready for it. Well, there's no... 
appropriate transition. It's not deliberate. It's, ah, uh, screw you. You're not doing this anymore. You're doing that now. Free babysitting service from the government. Nothing the government says is free. It's free, of course. And, uh, yeah, people are really struggling to adapt. So I asked him, you know, so what's the, you know, what's the biggest challenge you guys are facing? And they said, well, you know, not going to events, not doing high school stuff. It's like, it's not that hard. It's more phone time. But really the hardest thing is we can't find enough young men who are qualified, who are tough enough, who are fit enough. Ah! <laughs> Woo! Talk about the system eating its own tail. We have forced our kids to stay home, and now they're even less fit, and they can't be fit enough to join the military. Uh, I, I'd make jokes about fat cops, but we've seen too many shootings from cops who couldn't run down their targets and instead shot them in the back recently. So do, just do, do you not see this contradiction here? When your government says, Going to the gym is dangerous, but joining the military is safe. You need to stop trusting that government. So they're trying to tell you with all of this that those of us who want a more peaceful world, who want a more harmonious, less violent world, that we're the crazy ones. They were the sociopaths. Okay. So let's let's go let's let's get some background on this subject, shall we? SmithsonianMag.com. And this is from 2012. We've known this for a while. Research suggests politicians are more likely to be psychopaths. Several of the characteristics that define a psychopath also correspond to the traits that make for effective leaders for politicians. This is true. Many people at some point have likely wondered if their boss is a psychopath. It turns out that if your boss is a politician, there's a good chance he or she is. Several of the characteristics that define a psychopath also correspond to the same traits that make for effective leaders. Now, this is the, 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 there's something that I think is that, that is severely confused about this premise because they have effective leaders. I, I don't think, I mean, if, if, if a psychopath is someone who is disconnected from other human beings, lack of empathy, um, and, and, and to me, the core defined characteristic of a psychopath is complete inability to have normal human relationships, whereas a sociopath is just like, you know, a few degrees better on that continuum. But if you, if, if you are power hungry and, and you are smart and don't care about other people, you can use them to wield power, and in our current system of government... Those are the kinds of people who rise to the top. I don't think that makes for an effective leader because in order to really lead effectively, you have to have empathy for people who you're leading. Now, I'm against all forms of coercive leadership, and I would say that all forms of coercive leadership are, in, in, in some degree, or in, in, in some level, psychopathic. If, if I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to lead you, but really, I'm enslaving you. Uh, I'm going to lead you in the sense that I'm going to be in charge of the government, this country, this territory, but you can't lead. I'm, I'm keeping you prisoner somehow. That does, that does, that's not leadership. That's victimization. And the way that I've seen the literature cover this intersection of psychopathy and politicians and leadership has kind of left out the fact that being a leader of a, an unethical organization does you know, you might be effective, but that's not a good thing. You have to separate the skill set required to be the, the, you know, head of a gang versus the head of a church, right? So the, uh, you know, the, the reasons behind this, I think, deserve examining as well. And this gets to uh, our next story from Psychology Today. A little more recently, from 2019, four reasons why we elect narcissists and sociopaths. Candidates and voters need to understand narcissistic and sociopathic leaders. So, um, in a nutshell, here are four of the reasons why this occurs and will continue at all levels of society around the world until people realize 
the personality patterns they are voting for. Seductive personalities, whether in dating, hiring, or electing people, narcissists and sociopaths are the two most seductive personalities on the planet. For those narcissists and sociopaths who also want to be politicians, they learn how to seduce whole populations and can be temporarily highly effective long enough to get elected, but then are usually very harmful in the long run. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty good description of government itself, right? So most people miss the simple early warning signs of these high conflict politicians. Now, they, okay. All right, I'll just get it. I'll just read it. One, preoccupied with blaming others. Two, lots of all or nothing thinking. Three, unmanaged or intense emotions. Four, extreme behavior or threats. Are there any politicians outside uh, within the duopoly who don't have these warning signs? I mean, preoccupied with blaming others. It's not the Democrats' fault. It's not our, our fault. It's the Republicans' fault. I'm pretty sure even down to the city council level, everybody who's been suckered into putting on the red or blue socialist team jersey ends up preoccupied to some degree with blaming others lots of all or nothing thinking yeah we're right they're wrong voting you you're with the government or you're against us with the majority or against us majority rules democracy three unmanaged or intense emotions yeah all right fair enough on this one there's some politicians who are pretty reserved but they all use or entice unmanaged or intense emotions right in their constituents. Now, number four, extreme behavior or threats. Well, everything government does is backed up by a threat. And anytime someone says, I'm a politician and I want to get paid to be a politician, I'm going to pass laws that are going to affect you. What are those laws backed up with? The threat of imprisonment, the threat of being fined, of having your stuff stolen from you. I guess it's not extreme in the sense that it's common. I mean, maybe you want to say the extreme has become common. <laughs> All right. But certainly threats. All right. So number two, High emotion media in the past, political parties, unions, business leaders, and others had time to observe the true personalities of those who wanted to be leaders. Elections were usually between people screened for a variety of skills before becoming candidates. Nowadays, with network television, cable TV, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, there's a lot of competition to get attention for a candidate. But since anyone can run for almost any office now, this means that people with extreme personalities will get the most attention. And... I think the moment of, of Donald Trump 2016 really personified this in the sense that he beat a very crowded Republican primary field and did so with some serious emotional appeals and attention getting strategy. Three, the fantasy crisis triad. In reading the history of the most high conflict politicians over the past hundred years, I found a very similar pattern for all of them. It's Easy to learn and easy to spot. There are three parts. One, there's a terrible crisis threatening us all. It's caused by an evil villain, an individual or group. And three, an incredible hero is needed. Typically, an exciting outsider will quickly slay the villain and solve the crisis with easy all or nothing solutions. The fantasy hero is the HCP who couldn't get elected if it was based on skills. So they have to create or declare a crisis in order to get everyone thinking about the fantasy crisis triad rather than analyzing real abilities or analyzing whether the crisis is the most important thing we should be focusing on at all right now. Hello, it was Donald Trump declared the state of emergency. Oh yeah, we have to, it's an emergency. We've got a virus going around. And now he's the hero, right? If you look at, look at what we're seeing right now with coverage with the RNC. All right, four, four-way voter split. But not everyone misses the warning signs. In fact, throughout the examples I researched, the high-conflict politicians rarely reach the support of more than 40% of the population. The majority of the people never supported the HCP as a leader. However, the majority become divided, fought with each other, and became hopelessly ineffective. Even though they were able to see the disaster that the high-conflict politician presented, who was not a hero at all, they still tended to believe in the fantasy crisis and the fantasy villain. They were emotionally seduced as well. So the eligible voters tend to split into four groups. Now, first, this is, again, they still believe in the fantasy crisis and the fantasy villain. This is that Mark Twain, it is easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled principle at work. Oh, that politician is bad, but the Republicans are still good and the Democrats are still evil. Yeah, I still believe that because you can't, I, I mean, I, that, that, they, 
You couldn't have convinced me of that if it wasn't true. I'm so smart. I mean, occasionally I make mistakes, but no, of course. And these, these beliefs get entrenched. And so there's a lot of this in the American political mythology. But anyway, the four groups, loving loyalists, riled up resistors, mild moderates, disenchanted dropout. And this is this is a the very manipulative way of dividing people. And it's it's not just divide and conquer, but divide and control and manipulate. Now, this is something that again we've known about for a long time. This isn't like, oh yeah, Adam's no, I'm just reminded when when they come out and say and it, like Newsweek, really Newsweek, and you know what? It's not just this. It's not just Newsweek. This article, this study. Uh, there are a lot of people talking about this right now. Like, oh well, if you don't wear a mask in public, you're a sociopath. You're a psychopath. You're you hate people. You're a misanthrope. What really? Sorry, the opposite is what's true. Now, it's not necessarily that if you're wearing a mask, you are the opposite. But most people who are those real sociopaths not wearing masks, I don't think that's as much a phenomena as, as, as this article would even have you believe, right? Because I don't hear people going around, well, I'm not going to wear a mask because I don't care about you and you and you and I'm safe because I'm young and healthy and fuck y'all. No, it's like, it's a hoax. I don't get it. I don't want to contribute to the fear. The thing is that that sociopath in a situation like this is much more likely to be agreeable and go along and get along and be charming and not not cause too much trouble, right? It really was like, a, 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 I mean, nobody said anything. I walked into Walmart, you know, and there, there were a few people around the entrance, staffers with like clipboards, and I think they could have a box of masks or something like that. And they all looked at me as I came in. And um, I think they were all giving me frowny faces, but I couldn't tell because, you know, they were wearing masks. Uh, dirty looks? Not really. I don't know. I don't think so. I wasn't really paying attention. I was just like, all right, well, I'm going to I'm gonna walk through. I'm going to try to stay six feet away from all the zombies pushing my cart unless I see someone not wearing a mask, in which case, high five. And I, I really like this is like my fantasy right now is I want, uh, you know, and maybe we should start doing this. Like anytime you see someone in public not wearing a mask when you're not wearing a mask and other people are wearing masks, high five, I love you, no mask crew. I don't know, something like that. Just, I've, I've done elbow bumps, you know, a little more. Fist bumps, no mask, I love you, I love people. I'm not a psychopath. Yeah. Now, so when I say the opposite is true, yeah, I mean that for the people, most of the people not wearing masks. Not that most people wearing masks are psychopaths or sociopaths. They're more compliant personality disorder, obedient personality disorder, subservient personality disorder, or they're and often like as opposed to being you know a, a centered, emotionally happy, healthy, whole human being. Uh, people people are often split with that dom sub personality, right? Like they they're they're they are Karens. Who want to dominate and bully their neighborhoods, but they're sort of subservient when it comes to politicians and leaders. Or anybody has more power than them, and and really that that does characterize the authoritarian personality type. Because the authoritarian personality type is not just I want to be in charge. I'm the authority, and I need as much authority as possible. But it's more uh, the, the belief that authority is good, and and I'm not saying authority is good or by I, I mean in a sense authority is good. You know, legitimate authority by by virtue. Uh, by by voluntary cooperation, yes, in that sense, authority is good. Authority by uh, intimidation, by threats, by coercion—that's bad, right? And that's that's really what we're talking about. And so they, they at the same time want to be dominant, but also submissive. And it's a, it's a very primitive human characteristic. It's like dogs, right? Dogs as pack animals. There's 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 kind of an alpha, right? There's or, or chickens. There's a pecking order, and it's it's th there's this constant desire to get to the top but there's also a willingness to submit completely when there's a bigger dog and this is a really i don't want to say i mean danger it is a dangerous mentality right this is how wars happen 
Oh, bad guys over there. Go get them. Everybody, uh, put on a uniform, pick up a gun, and go kill people without asking any questions. Quick, go. Uh, yeah. Um, that's uh, problematic, shall we say. And, and this has been shown in, you know, the Milgram obedience studies. If you're in a psychology like me, you know, look it up. Uh, you can see that it's it's really easy to manipulate someone into giving another subject, a test subject, uh, electric shocks because I've got a clipboard. I've got a white lab coat. I'm standing closer to you and intimidating you. Like that stuff works. So when you have a population that supports a system like this, that is willing to vote, like that, the, the other article said, instead of based on skills in the steady hand of actual leadership, is it? I mean, because really, when you're giving leadership of an unethical organization, you don't go, oh, I'm going to be an effective leader. You go, let's get rid of this whole thing. Let's dissolve it, right? But as long as we have systems, whether they're corporate or social, or governmental where sociopaths and psychopaths are able to play on your emotions to get you to vote a certain way to exploit you, they'll always be able to. This will always be a feature of the system as long as the paradigm supports it. We, we don't fight this by shooting politicians. We fight this by educating the public and saying, don't let yourself be emotionally manipulated. This is why, for me, the message of freedom, it's so important to talk about emotional freedom because that's what liberates you from being manipulated by these sociopaths, by these psychopaths. And just for a second, for fun, we're going to turn to wikipedia.org for psychopathy in the workplace. And there's, again, fun studies. You want to look it up. Careers with the highest portions of psychopaths. I, I mean, I've studied this stuff like way back in college. Number one, CEO. I don't think that's a career. That's that's a category of accomplishment. What's really interesting here is that they took out politicians, right? They wanted to protect politicians. Um, but like CEO, you're, you're in business. And you say business. Well, who's now successful? CEO. Lawyer, media, TV, radio. Well, it's a good thing I'm not on the TV or the radio anymore. Uh, salesperson. Yeah, I mean, manipulation through sales, sure. Sturgeon, journalist, and then I was, I, yeah, journalist, really. And then police officer, number seven is police officer on this list. And then eight, clergy, nine, chef, a little surprising. Yeah, don't piss off your server or your food will get spat in. Uh, but number 10, civil servant. Number 11, Karen. Yeah, they included that on the updated version of the study. No, but now why am I getting into all this? Not just to refute this, uh, the, the significance. Right? I'm, not, I'm not trying to refute the article itself, but the reasons that people are, and, and Karens are, are using this, right? It's a kind of gaslighting. It's, hey, you know how we've been crazy and you're starting to catch on? No, we're not crazy, you're crazy. Now, you think, Adam, wearing masks isn't crazy. I'm like, yeah, I know. It might just be that you're a sucker. I mean, it is it is crazy stupid. But like in and of itself, is it wearing masks is not the crazy behavior here, right? Now, you know, as, as a libertarian with a political talk show, when I talk about the craziness of coronavirus and coronaphobia, I'm talking about lockdowns and shutdowns. And and what is that? It is you, it's government telling you. You don't have the right to set your own level of risk. We're going to do it for you. And if you do something that's risky in a way that we don't like, gun to your head, we're shutting you down. And I'm not exaggerating. Like, and I've, I've actually been a little bit surprised by how heavy-handed some of the enforcement has been. We covered the story of the diner where, because they got to shut down, or they came into the, the, uh, the police came with a locksmith and changed the locks on the building. Now, you, you might be going, well, Adam, that's just government. We know that government and politicians are psychopaths. We know that that's the case. Well, there's, there's another battleground here that's really important to be aware of. Because it's not just the politicians. It's not just the psychopath civil servants being oh so civil about 
mask policy enforcement. It's the base. And so there's this bigger segment of the population that is actively engaged in supporting this policy. And, and I'm not talking about everybody that's going along. And if you're going along, stop. Please stop. Don't ever wear a mask proactively. You go into any major corporate establishment, you can walk through without a mask 90% of the time. No one's going to say anything. The other 10%, they're going to say, would you like a mask? Did you forget your mask? And if they push it, you say, please leave me alone. I have a medical exemption. And they'll leave you alone. They can't do anything more than that. The only other thing they can do, and we experienced this once at a natural grocer's a few weeks ago, to say, hey, we don't allow anyone inside without masks, but we do offer curbside service. So you tell us what you want, we'll just put it on a piece of paper, we'll take it out to you. You don't want to wear a mask. They, they have to accommodate you one way or another. Walmart's not doing that. So no, you can go in. They're not going to say anything. And I encourage everybody to take that position to never wear a mask proactively. Now, if you have to, if it's sort of like, well, the only way they'll let me in this establishment, I got to go get this car part or this, I got to go talk to this doctor or I got to go to the DMV, uh, uh, then yeah. Okay, wear a mask. And if you can, wear, wear, show some sign of defiance. Like wear, wear, wear with your nose show. You're like, yeah, I'm just doing this symbolically. Fuck you. Or, you know, hanging off your ear or whatever it is. But I want to talk not just to the psychopath politicians, the sociopath bureaucrats, but the Karens, the people who have been acting crazy, bullying other people into wearing masks. And I've heard a lot of bad stories about this, but I'm gonna go back to a story that we covered in July for this next, the next little bit. Yahoo.com, do you remember this? Matt Schneiderman, this article went super viral. It's okay to yell at strangers who don't wear masks. And it was the people who shared this story and the Newsweek story who have been acting crazy. And maybe it's because of fear. Maybe it's because of trauma. Those are usually the causes of sociopathic behavior. But they have been scared into being sociopaths, I guess if you want to excuse their agency in this, I think this is an expression of authoritarian personality disorder. And when they're coming out and saying, go yell at people, I mean, do I, do I have to get into this? Or do you remember how crazy this was? They're telling you to escalate all the way up to say, go fuck yourself and yell at someone in their face for not wearing a mask. Here, I'll quote the story. If a person is blatantly putting others at risk, you've tried the above tactics and you're not in a business setting and want to get a message across, go for it. Let loose a salvo of swear words. Sometimes you just need to yell. Though, so this coronavirus has turned a lot of Americans into that crazy homeless guy on the street corner yelling at everybody going by for being wrong about something. And it's a process. No one, no, one, very, very few people, I should say, have the presence of mind and humility, self-control, discipline necessary to say, oh, shit. You're right. God damn it. I was misled. I was scared. And because I'm emotionally weak, I'm beaten down. I'm a typical American who went to a government school and has been a cog in the machine my entire life and believed authority. And because of that, I, I was fooled and scared and, and, and uh, just bullied into, into being crazy, into being a crazy bully and bullying other people. And I'm sorry, uh, you know, I, I can admit that. And, um, you know, I'll do my best to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I will work on myself and strengthen myself, my, my mind, my, my soul, my psyche, and make sure that I'm, I'm not prone to this kind of manipulation again. So I don't hurt you, my, my fellow Americans, by going along with this madness. That would be nice, wouldn't it? No, no, it doesn't happen that way. Me crazy? No, you're crazy! And when you see that for what it is, I think for the rest of us, it's just a call for that much more patience 
and compassion. You don't fix crazy with crazy. You don't fight fire with fire. Use water. So when it comes to this insanity, I just hope those of us who are sane and have this reasonable perspective can look at those who don't with love and compassion.